Uh, English. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so, first of all, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so, let me introduce myself. I'm Carlos Ron. I have uh, two responsibilities in the Bolivarian government. I am uh, Vice Minister for North America. And I'm also president of the Simón Bolívar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among Peoples. Um, and my comrade here, Guillermo Barreto, who is uh, one of the directors of the Institute for uh, analysis, Strategic Analysis and Communications. Yes. So, that's his official title. Ana Karina, who was here. Uh, so, so let me first of all welcome you all. Uh, to Caracas. I know, I know some of you, and I know some of you are coming also for the first time. So, welcome to Caracas. Uh, this is also a very special place in Caracas, this house. This is, we call it the Yellow House. Um, although, um, right now, there's a, they, they painted another <laughs> house in the alternate corner, which is more yellow than this one, and I'm kind of upset about that, because it's going to confuse people. But this house is very important for us because it's it's the site of the first of the of the uh, colonial government. So the the first uh, um, when when the Spanish uh, uh, invaded Venezuela, settled here, um, and they settled Caracas, that became the capital of the country. This square that you see right outside of here was the the, the center the, where the city was founded it began and this site was the site was the, the chair of government mm -hmm. so during the rule of the spanish the representative from the spanish crown ruled from here until in 1810 in our first movement for independence uh we were able to force basically the the spaniards uh to leave the captain general who was here in what we call was uh, as you know the, the first recall referendum that we had in in Venezuela, mm -hmm. he was he was fresh. This this is 1810 when Napoleon invades Spain, so the crown of Spain, that as was known, you know, uh, Ferdinand VIII, was no longer king. It was now somebody from Napoleon who was taking over. Mm -hmm. So the the patriots here in Venezuela decided, okay, this is our chance to. Uh, push for some autonomous rule. Mm -hmm. We can claim that we're still defending the rights of the crown. The crown has been taken over by the French, so we, we can't recognize that government, and we need to then rule ourselves mm -hmm. on behalf of the crown. Mm -hmm. But that was a trick, because that's the way you, you know, first cut the ties, mm -hmm. and then a year later, we actually declared independence. Mm -hmm. So the way to do that was they pressured the captain general to come back. Uh, it was a, a Holy Week, uh, uh, church events, they forced him back from the church to come back here and, you know, pressure him to resign. He had just arrived a few weeks earlier and he wasn't very enthusiastic about also being here and he felt, you know, the pressure and, the, and, and you know, the commotion. So he says, you know what, I'm going to go. He opens up the balcony, talks to the people in the square and says, you know, do you want me to stay here or do you want me to leave? And then everything was already arranged, so that people would say, no, we want to leave. So, so everybody, you know, mm -hmm. asked them to go, mm -hmm. and that's what we said. It was the first actual recall referendum, and then people actually mm -hmm. said, you have to go. He left, and that's when we, and that's the first moment of Venezuelan independence. Mm -hmm. So that, all that happened in this house where you're at. Right mm -hmm. so, um, it would be good if, you, if we also do a round, so we know, so I, you told me a little bit about yourselves. Yo comienzo y déjame empezar con una pregunta primero. Uh, que con, referencia, con referencia a Norteamérica, ¿qué uh, es Norteamérica del Norte? Yeah. Sí. Oh, I think you said. Perdón, perdón. Oh, um, we could, oh, we could actually do, we could do interpretation. Yeah, let me do that. Okay. Your role, your position, uh, what? 
what do you do with reference of North America and your title is but America del Norte, so you only deal with North America, I don't want to say America. Mm -hmm. United States, you only deal with the United States or you deal with all of the Americas? No. North America, the United States and Canada. Okay, okay. and what has been supremely the latest that you be dialogue for the last of the world that you have done with North America because I understand that there are no relations, no diplomatic relations, correct me if I'm wrong. There are no diplomatic relations, right? Right. So what have your office done in relation to the United okay. North America? Okay. Your name is? Guillermo. Guillermo Kuhn. Oh, okay. Guillermo. So, so obviously, uh, you know, we, we deal, we, regardless whether you have uh, relations or not, you have to deal with, mm. consider all countries around the world in a foreign ministry. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we used to have relations up until 2019 with uh, the United States. So, uh, my office takes care precisely of the relations with those two countries, like I said, Canada and the United States. We also include Puerto Rico in that uh, division because, unfortunately, Puerto Rico, I mean, it, the, the governing, the, the legal representation is on, on the hands of the United States. If a government from Puerto Rico shows a passport, it's a U.S. passport, so we have to include them in North America, even though they're a Latin American country. Uh, and the idea is to have relations with, I mean, to, to, to deal with the relations of those countries. When you break re diplomatic relations in the sense that we've broken, uh, it doesn't mean that we stopped talking to them. Mm -hmm. we, we have been involved in a dialogue process for uh, even, you know, before and after the rupture of relations. So we still have uh, talks with the United States. We still, we still have to, every year we go to the United Nations. I mean, we, so we, at least we have to communicate with them for visas and all these day-to-day mm -hmm. uh, -day things. But also there's conversations between the two governments. Mm -hmm. um, and also, of course, there's Canada which we have not broken relationship. We have, a, we have a maybe not a smooth relationship, but it's, it, uh, we do have relationship. But also there's the people. I mean, the fact that you break relations with government doesn't mean that you cut off the people. The fact that you are here is part of people's diplomacy. That's what we do. So we may not have a relations with the government, but we have relations with people of the United right. States because we mm -hmm. think that you know, it's important. We have a history, um, and you know, I just talked a bit about, about the history of this house. But we have, a, we have US born citizens who came to fight for Venezuelan independence. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have Francisco Miranda, who's not in this room, but is, is up, upstairs in, in another, uh, in one of the uh, ex exhibits upstairs, who fought in the US War of Independence too. So, and from then on, there's been a lot of ties. So we have people-to-people -people ties, and, and, and it's important that we, uh, that we can maintain those ties, because if we ever going to change the scenario of our relations, we, we have to work with international solidarity. Keep the door open. Exactly. Okay, Thank you. And, uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, so Guillermo Kiel, uh, salí de Nicaragua en el 78. I left the United States, they know, know my story, but just so you know. <laughs> I left the United States in 1978, September, Nicaragua. What did I say? I left in 78 in September when I was 14 years old because my mother feared that the Somoza regime would kill us. In fact, they were killing chavalos, muchachos. And uh, we ended up in San Francisco, a good place to end up because all the activists, and that's how I did Ever since I've been involved in activism and in solidarity with Nicaragua and every country that has been under cloud. Uh, stay food and, uh, and uh, so I moved there became ra radicalized and, uh, and lived there for 20 years 20 30 I lost count but then I moved to Atlanta mm -hmm. now I live in Atlanta okay and I now I'm involved with Alliance for Global Justice Nika Solidarity Networks and a few other uh, non Latin American organizations and uh, here I am if you have any questions Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you. Same here. Uh, should we go down there? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. from Central Minnesota. He's an activist and a lieutenant here in this country. Welcome.
Welcome. First time, William? No. <laughs> I've been involved in it a number of times and always grateful for being received here. Welcome, to welcome. Good to see you. Uh, Richard. Yeah. <clears throat> Richard Hobbs in San Jose, California, Silicon Valley. I'm a founder of a nonprofit called Human Agenda. We do solidarity work, we help with cooperative, we depend on immigrants and deportation procedures. Mm -hmm. First time. Here. First time. Here. <laughs> <laughs> William. Right. William. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Rendon. Uh, I'm from Minnesota in the United States. And uh, I've been an activist for quite some time. Uh, and anything that deals with American empire, I resist. I'm Bala. I'm from Canada. But I have met you on the. On the we have meeting many times, but this is the first time I've seen you. Welcome. So it is interesting to see and we're going to meet. That's Thank you. Thank you. My name's Martha Rollins, and I'm a, a U.S. citizen and a Costa Rica permanent resident. And I have met Good you choice. before. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I thought so too. Uh, I have met you, but you don't, I'm sure you don't remember me. I was here with Terry Matson in a no sanctions delegation okay. at the time of Guaido, which okay, was very okay. no electricity. Everything was all. I tried to raise that from my memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I'm very. I'm with Code Pink and other. Oh, welcome groups. back. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm Polina Vasiliev. Um, I'm a, a translator interpreter with the delegation. I am also a, a producer, volunteer producer with Pacifica Radio. And uh, so hopefully we'll spread the word over there about what's going on here. It's my first time in Venezuela. I'm very excited. Good okay. to meet you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bishop Dexter. I'm from, originally from Angola. I'm an um, American citizen. I live in Boston, Massachusetts. My relationship with Venezuela started with the Boston Council, the Venezuela Council in Boston for many years. And I did fight a lot for the liberation of Alex Saab mm -hmm. in Cape Verde, Niger, and also in Massachusetts and Florida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, this is my first trip to Venezuela. <coughs> My name is David Brubaker. I'm from San Francisco, California, and I want to thank you for having me here for the fourth time. Welcome back. So I'm Giselle Perdo. I'm Hi. Venezuelan, and I'm helping out the AFGJ. I've been doing that for some years, and I'm happy to be here. It's great to see you, Carlos. Mm -hmm. You know me. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll introduce myself. My name is Yamir Chabur. I'm an activist from New York City, um, proud Colombian American. I feel happy to be here in Venezuela, uh, the land of my forefathers, Simon Bolivar, not George Washington, but Bolivar. Um, <laughs> this is my, no, my third time in Venezuela. And, you know, and I'm just happy to be here during uh, this election season and in support of uh, this Bolivarian process. Very good. I'm Marlon Nunez. Um, I've been coming here for my whole life. My dad's side of the family is from uh, Sulia and Tachira. Um, it's really great seeing you again. Thanks so much for having us. Um, something that I'd like to share is even though I've been coming here forever, uh, this is my third political delegation. And for me, that's a really important shift because family is very important, but instead of weddings and you know the unfortunate funeral or a new baby, I'm coming here to actually build power and improve the situation. Um, most recently I was working for the city of Denver where I live. Um, they had a, a migrant shelter program uh, for new com newcomers uh, to the U.S. Um, and we were getting buses to the city from Texas and maybe 90% of those who we served were Venezuelan. And so that was a very special project for me because you know, I, I firmly believe that people have what's called the right to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's, you know, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that as people go through life, they make choices instead of being forced through um, your empire to, you know, to, make, to suffer, basically. And there were a lot of uh, really hard choices that I, I saw people have to make. Um, and you know, I, I want to speak people to have to do that as possible. So 
it's a pleasure here to it's a pleasure to be here to to just uh, make sure that the correct information is being shared to the world. Welcome back. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natalia. We've been in communication yes. a bit over email. Um, I work we for made it. We finally yes, made we made it. it. <laughs> yes, I want to thank you so much for welcoming us to your beautiful country. Um, I work obviously for Alliance for Global Justice with William. We work together on the delegations, and I just wanted to thank you again for having us. Thank you for being here. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll share with you some ideas about where I think we're at and, and, and about the importance of you being here uh, at this time. Um, this is a very important election. I think it's going to be number 32 in 25 years. There's a thing about counting because some, some people say 31 and they say 32. But we're counting 32 because in April uh, there was there was actually a, a, a very interesting type of election, which was a, a national consultation on the com on communal projects, and you must have heard a bit about this. But summing it up, each commune there was 4,500 uh, territories. They were able to vote on local projects, <coughs> and out of up to seven projects, they would pick. Can choose one that would then be funded and will be the you know the priority. Um, so that was a very particular uh, exercise in in direct democratic participation with, that we have here in Venezuela. So the elections that we've had, uh, or the the culture of elections that we have, is very rich. It's not just your you know president. Uh, parliamentarian or, or governor, or whatever, you have you have a uh, Venezuela established since uh, 1999's new constitution, a constant uh, you know consultation on important matters. Mm -hmm. We established the recall referendum. We we established in the constitution, so that means that anybody can be recalled. Any public official that's been elected can be recalled. We have consultations on different types of important matters for the country. We just had an important consultation in December on the issue of uh, Guayana Esequiba, which is a territory that um, the Venezuela still claims is a uh, historical dispute for almost 200 years. And, and we might go over that a little bit later. Um, and we had these type of consultations from uh, people's power. I say this because, as you well know, you know, the narrative is that Venezuela is a dictatorship, there's no freedom, there's no democracy. And, uh, and, and I don't think, I, th I think there are very few, I'm not gonna say this is the best word, but I'm gonna say there's very few countries that have such a dynamic democracy as, as, as this one. Because people actually make changes. People actually matter in, in, in you know, the choices they make and, and, and how they, they carry them out. Now, what we are up against on less than a week from now, is, to me, it's not just an election. Uh, because it's not like, well, you know, if we have a better choice or another. I think we're, we're part of that confrontation that we're seeing worldwide between forces that are on the side of the people, that are trying to build a more humanistic alternative, that I believe that the world has to shift, you know, from a unipolarity guided by exploitation from imperialism to something different. Well, we're moving forward with that proposal, and we're gonna, and we're facing the re, the the reaction of the extreme right, and the extreme right in Venezuela has its expression. It's, I mean, we, we've been in a revolutionary process for the last 25 years, but that doesn't mean there's no right wing, that doesn't mean there's no fascism in Venezuela. It's actually a, a long history of fascism in Venezuela. In the 1950s, we were under a dictatorship of at least 10 years, where I think fascism actually flourished in Venezuela. We had, we had a dictator, Marcos Perez Jimenez, in the military, who believed that you know, uh, promoting migration from Europe, meaning Spain, Italy, Portugal, meaning white mm -hmm. migration, 
would improve the race, and text, this is, I should quote, would improve the race. So it, 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 there's a vision of racism, uh, of, of, uh, also of you know, complete uh, obliteration of left-wing politics or an organization that was part of Venezuelan history, and it governed the country for 10 years. And then it was overthrown by revolutionary forces, by communist and uh, social, democrat, uh, social democratic forces. Eventually, the US was able to capture social democrats uh, and, and also, again, uh, attack the left and the communists. But that, those forces are still in play. Those forces still exist in the country. And I say this because in recent years, where we clearly, you know, carrying out a revolutionary process, where people are not excluded because of race, where people are not excluded because of poverty, but actually you know, they're, they've been tried to, you know, to be integrated into national life, where they actually have participation, where they can actually decide projects on their own. Uh, of course, that's going to that's going to naturally generate a reaction from those that once held this you know, power of this country as if it was its own personal place, farm, you know, property. Uh, our ambassador, Samuel Moncada, who is ambassador at the UN, I'm sure you, you, you've heard of him and seen him, you know, he used to say that when, when, when I say, or when we say, uh, you know, that we're Venezuelan, so we feel Venezuelan because well, we were born here, because we you know have the culture, we have arepas, you know that, that sort of thing. And so so we say Venezuela is our country, and and you know you, you, because you identify with the country. When a person like Maria Corina Machado says Venezuela is my country, is that she literally means it's hers, <laughs> it's her property, it's her backyard, and we are all some sort of you know people, Some you know. Subjects. No, not even subjects. I mean, we're we're occupying her land, Correct. and we have, and she wants to get us, get us out. This is the type of confrontation that I think is, is playing out next, you know, in the election next, next week. And I say this because if if the right wing, if that if that political group in Venezuela actually wanted to have a an election to actually dispute ideas, actually dispute government, you know, proposals. They would have chosen candidates that can run. She she couldn't run because uh, you all must know this, but there's several things that she did. I mean, there's there's administrative issues, but besides that, you know, there's actual participation in calling for an invasion, in uh, delete, delete, not recognizing the legitimate institutions of 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 the state, I mean, they, they have they basically have a parallel electoral body, Sumate, which is you know for, for a while they did. they received funding from the United States to uh, to intervene in the in, in, in the election in, in various election processes, but also there was a point where she, as a deputy of the National Assembly, went to uh, an assembly at the Organization of American States and was named appointed. Ambassador of Panama, or, or permanent representative of, of, of Panama, so that she could sit at the table and attack her own country. This is, this, I mean, no country in the world find this somehow acceptable or would think that this is an issue about, oh, I just have a different opinion. And, you know, the, and if we do anything about it, it's not democratic because we have, diff, you know, the, they're persecuting my opinion. This is not an opinion, this is an actual attack on the country, on the nation, uh, because again, it's not a nation for her, it's her property. She feels, she comes from a line of people that own uh, land in Venezuela, that own uh, the electrical uh, uh, companies that were, that were later nationalized. So this is, this is a, a, a accumulation of resentment. Now, I'm not gonna point all this to her, because she's one of the many actors that feel this way. There's a group of people. And this group of people, this same group of people that promoted violence in 2014, 2017, that promoted, you know, 
the violent attacks in the streets that burn people alive because of their skin color, because if they're darker, they, they must be Chavistas, so you have to go and kill them. And they actually did this. So, and this is, these are basically the people that have not believed in democracy, have not accepted democracy uh, throughout all this time. It's funny because the narrative that you hear is that, you know, ah, you know, uh, Edmundo, who is the person she ultimately picked as her, the, her representative, he has 20, 30 points above everybody else, you know, and beyond everybody else. Um, uh, you know, the, the, of course they're going to win, and President Maduro is not going to accept the results. If you look at the history of Venezuelan elections during the last 25 years, the only ones that have actually recognized defeats is Chavismo, is the revolutionary forces. We uh, recognized defeat in 2007 when we lost the, uh, the amendment of the Constitution, which, by the way, the difference, the vote difference was around, somewhere around 16,000 votes. That's very little. And, and I say this because there was no, at no point was there, we have to count, we don't trust the system, we, you know, there must have been some fraud. No, that was, that was the result, that was the result. We have faith in our system and we lost, but we have to recognize. We did that, they didn't do that. Even, you know, they only recognize when they win. Mm -hmm. and, and they won, they won, they have, they, they rule cities, they rule states, they have. So this is not, this is, this is not a country that is completely ruled by Chavismo, by President Maduro, by the PSU. No, there are opposition forces in government in this country. And second of all, uh, uh, the other and the other the other time we, we, we lost was the National Assembly in 2015, uh, and we accepted that as well. Um, and and that was a lot of problems for the country. Because those were the ones that then appointed from white vote, you know, there was this uh, craziness that, that has taken us to the point where we're at today. If I may add, we became sort of like a let's say puppet, and, and that caused the Compañía Petrolera to be handed over to him, and for Britain to keep the goal. Yeah, because by not recognizing uh, the Venezuelan government, they, they've used that as an excuse as to say, well, Venezuela doesn't have an, uh, the right to appoint the board of CITGO in the U.S., or Venezuela can't claim to uh, have access to the accounts in England, the gold in England, or other foreign accounts that we have, because, you know, oh, it's not the real government, it's not the legitimate government. Of course they know it's the legitimate government, but it's a way to neutralize the capabilities of the governments to move, yeah, to, to, to impede the government to be able to uh, move. And that's why, still until today, they recognize the assembly of 2015. That assembly, I mean, that, uh, the period you know, expired, there was a new election, there's a new, there's, no, there's always gonna be another assembly already by, you know, uh, next, next year, no? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the next year. And, and so, so there's going to be almost two assemblies after that, and they still recognize in the 2015 one, which is where the opposition won. Because if they change that position, then they have to give back Silva, they have to give back gold, they have to give back mm -hmm. their accounts. But also the state, the state was recommended in 2015, actually, Huh? The United States uh -huh. recognized. Yeah. The no, no, they still, they still do. Yeah. So, and, and, that's, and that's a problem because, and, 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 and this is the point I want to get at. The issue we have on this election is not whether we're going to win or not. And I'll tell you, and I'll explain why I say this. And this is my own perspective. Because I don't think, I think the revolution is going to win again. And I think, you know, we have a, a, a good um, chance of, you know, uh, continuing and, 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 and having a good outcome. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why in a bit because, and then I'll tell you my, my perception why that is so. But but what I want to get, to, what I want you to understand is that that's not the point of this election. Because the people that are against Venezuela 
have not recognized re elections since 2018. Mm -hmm. They have not recognized the current term of President Maduro mm -hmm. because they recognized the Assembly of 2015. Mm -hmm. And this is, main, this is mainly the United States and those countries that follow or are pressured or, or easily manipulated by the United States and do the same thing. And it's a handful of countries, not really that many countries. Because at one point, the number of countries was growing, and then when everything fell apart, they thought we were only going to last two weeks, and they realized that, you know, some people kept going, that the whole thing fell apart. And many of those countries started to ask, well, let's talk again, let's have conversations, and many of those countries that took their ambassadors out send new diplomats in and you know relations have, have been rebuilding mm -hmm. but the united states has been standing mm -hmm. so to not recognize a country to not recognize a, a country's legitimate uh uh institutions it's an uh, it's an assault on international law mm -hmm. there's actually uh there's in a famous trial in nicaragua against the united states mm -hmm. where this is actually a something that's established, where you know it's legal for you to support the opposition in, a, in another state, because that's intermission into another state's affairs. It's also illegal to not recognize those government's institutions. So this is actually against international law. The United States is, hasn't recognized Venezuela's institutions, ha, didn't recognize the 2018 election, an election which, by the way, I know for a fact, because it affected me personally, I know for a fact that you know it was one of the elections where there was more intervention of the United States. Uh, I mean, it was always intervention of the United States, but it was very it was very visible. The at the time, the the person in charge of the U.S. embassy in Caracas actually visited many of the candidates that wanted to run in that election, and threatened each candidate with sanctions if they kept, you know, if they actually ran. And only, basically only two of them continued, which were uh, Javier Bertucci, who's running this year again, and uh, Henry Falcón. And Henry Falcón, who was, who, who was the main opposition candidate. But all the other ones were threatened. And we had to, t and, and I say this, you know, I, I know it affected me personally, because we, we had to, after the election, we took the decision of expelling uh, the charge of affairs, and I was at the time charge of affairs in Washington, and I, of course, was expelled as well. Good. Mm. So, but 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 I say this to you because this is important. This is important for you to get this feeling that the level of intervention of the United States into Venezuela's election process is outrageous. It's huge. The fact that it's we're not you know our institutions are not recognized since 2015. <laughs> The fact that they, they're, you know, they're not saying they're going to recognize this result either. They're waiting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So they continue to defy international law. And most likely, I mean, if, if, we, if we look at the press reports and everything that's coming out, everybody's basically saying, you know, the opposition is going to win, you know, but let's see if Maduro's not going to accept. Uh, and then, you know, there's all these uh, tricks uh, Maduro is, is playing out and it's not letting people run. And so, so they're already building up the momentum so that any reader that, you know, opens a newspaper or a website or whatever and, and looks at what's going on in Venezuela automatically thinks that, you know, this is going to be, if we win, this is going to be an imposition by the government and, and, and not a real election. Why do I think we have real chances of winning, what I think this is all, you know, a, a made up story. <clears throat> because Venezuela, for 25 years, has changed dramatically. Like I said before, it was a country that was, ex there was a lot of exclusion, there was a lot of poverty, it was a, it's a very rich country, but the wealth wasn't going to the majority of the populations. That changed when President Chavez came, comes in. And President Chavez comes in with, a, with the vision of, of rebuilding the country, calling for us to participate into drafting a new, a new constitution and to, and to becoming a real participatory democracy, but also because President Chavez 
felt that you know that, that the, the Venezuelan government had a responsibility to tend to the necessities of the people, of the general population. Mm-hmm. And we started social programs that had never been implemented before or that had been implemented you know, half-heartedly before. And there was a land reform, there was ed- edu- you know, education. We, came, we became at a point the fifth country in the world with highest higher education enrollment, mm-hmm. which is free. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have private education in Minnesota, you also have free higher education. And we became the second country in Latin America after Cuba with higher education enrollment. And we eradicated literacy. And we, and we brought uh, Cuban doctors to places in Venezuela and rural areas and inner city areas where people had never seen doctors in their lives. And we created a parallel structure of, of hospitals because some of the old public hospitals were so run, run down and were so controlled by mafias that we had to build a, a parallel structure so we can actually take care of people. And all these things started to happen, and all these things from, you know, from, from the beginning of President Chavez's uh, presidency until he passed. And we, we experienced a whole different life. We that lived Venezuela through those years know how you know, every year we were making different accomplishments. We were, you know, people, if you, look at, if you look at images of the Caracaso, which is a very important period of time in Venezuela, 1989, the rebellion against neoliberalism in Venezuela, the hunger that people were undergoing. If you see the faces that come, you know, the, the, the body composition of those people, and you see people in maybe 2006, 7, 8, you see the difference, how people changed. You, you, you know, people were healthier, chubbier, you know. There was a profound transformation of Venezuelan society. And they unleashed the military. How many people were killed? When? In, uh, in 89 during the Caracas. Official count is somewhere around 300 people, but uh, to 250 or something. Like that. And 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 there were mass graves where at least 3,000 people uh, were killed or appeared in the mass graves. This was total state repression uh, on 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 people. Now, when President Chavez passes, it's a moment where where. I think the U.S. and the you know the power interests here said, "Look, this is the moment we have to attack because they're not going to be able to resist." Chavez is out; these people are just going to you know turn back. Let's pressure them, and they started implementing you know all these actions, uh, you know, and, and then attacking everything that had been an achievement by the government. So they attacked, the, you know, nutrition. They they blocked our capabilities of importing food, but with their allies here, they started hiding food from people and hiking up the prices. They destroyed that farm. They destroyed, yeah, the programs that were there to redistribute food. They, you know, they attacked those programs as well. You know, they attacked education. You know, uh, they attacked. They attacked. Uh, Everything that you could that, that you could possibly think um, was an achievement, they tried to specifically hurt people in those terms. Then they started. Then they started using sanctions as a policy. First, it started with Obama, which they determined that you know we're going to sanction people, individuals. But it's not really individuals because if you sanction somebody that, that represents a government entity and that and nobody can deal with that person, then you start affecting the whole country. And then Trump comes in, and then there's just the massive amount of, of uh, sanctions, where they blocked our capability of exporting oil, they blocked our capability of exporting gold, uh, other national resources that we have, and they started attacking different things. I mean, they attacked, uh, they sanctioned every ship. I mean, just, so you get an idea. If, if you're a country that you produce oil, because that's what the division of labor gave us. You produce oil and then you're gonna and then you have a tanker and you're gonna take it to another place. Well now the insurance on that tanker is triple you know, triples, quadruples. It's as expensive, just to give you an idea, it's as expensive to move a tanker in you know around Venezuela as it as it, as it was 
around Syria during the time of the, you know, the peak of, of the war in, in, in Syria. There's no comparison, but the insurance companies were charging that because of the sanctions I mentioned. Okay? Sanctions on everyday things also create problems for us in, social, in um, uh, public works. Because our electricity, uh, like, and like everything here, electricity, the oil companies, the water pumping system, everything was modeled at, you know, by US, mostly US, some European countries, but mostly US companies. Why is it relevant? Because if you block spare parts, if you block uh, companies from coming to do maintenance, then you, all of a sudden, then you, 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 you know, things are gonna start to decay. And people are gonna, and then they're gonna tell people, see, this is, this is the socialist government that can run things. But they, they, nobody, nobody, it's very hard for you to understand that it's because of a sanction and other, we, we weren't used to this, we didn't know what this was. Now we know, but at the moment we didn't know, you know what this was about. So, so they do this again to have the country run down, to create enough pain and, 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 up, and, and enough people upset that they turn against the government and then, they try to overthrow, the, or they vote against the government. The, the, the thing they weren't counting on was that the people, there was a, a huge uh, level of consciousness. And I think that same level of consciousness still exists today. And, and, we've, and we've come to understand that even if there's difficulties, even if we have you know, different types of uh, limitations, we know what we were able to achieve in revolution. And we know that we can still move forward. And we know we can, over, we, can, we know we can even overcome sanctions because we found different ways to move around them. So when people go out to vote on Sunday, they're gonna vote on, conscious that, you know, if we're gonna see any transformations that are going to benefit the people, it's, it's continuing the path we're on. And I, and I seriously believe that this is, this is a conviction of many Venezuelans. Not all, but many Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. And this is important because as part of that, and a part of that notion of particip participation, we've, you know, we drafted this government's platform, this candidate's platform. So candidate Nicolás Maduro presented a, point, uh, a plan of seven transformations that we all drafted together. Because he laid out at the beginning of the year, he laid out you know seven notions of where you know where we should be going or issues that we should be discussing, and we went to assemblies, and we did these assemblies here. I, I you know I, I headed some of these assemblies, and we had debates and we debated the issues and we wrote down the conclusions and we wrote papers and we sent them down, and and some and most of, of those ideas were processed and picked up and are reflected in the government platform that he's running on. It is the only platform out of the 10 candidates in running on, on Sunday's election that was actually discussed and processed by assemblies in the country. So if you ask me, you know, a lot of people know that this is a continuation of that revolution. A lot of people feel that they're part of the government program because they helped draft it. You have a reason to vote for this. And when you look at the right wing, and when you look at the opposition, there are many oppositions. You have these that we were talking about at the beginning, that their strategy is not electoral. The strategy is waiting for the day of the election to say, this is fraud, and, you know, they, they're cheating us. That's their strategy. But you have other people in the opposition that are not on the left, that are not revolutionary, that are neoliberals as well, but they are not on the sanction your country thing. You know, they're, they're on a different plane. They want to have a political future in Venezuela. They understand that a lot of people resent those who ask for sanctions, who ask for invasions, who ask for attack on the country. And they, but they, again, they want to maintain their political possibilities. They govern some of the cities here. They govern, you know, I think one of the states at least. Um, so they want, they want to have a role to play in the future of this country. They're going to run their own campaign. Bertucci, who you're talking about from the last election, who was one of the candidates of the last election, he, he comes from an evangelical background. And his project is tied to a religious vision of the country that is not the same 
a vision of this extreme right. So he's going to run on his own. You have forces uh, from the traditional social democrat, uh, you know, other uh, parties, you know, that, that govern Venezuela before Chavez, who still have strongholds in different communities within the states. They're running their own campaign. So you see, you have a lot of different oppositions. So if you add those things up, there's a very strong chance that, the, you know, objectively speaking, that the revolution is going to repeat a win. You even have one case, which I think is important to point out, which is Daniel Ceballos, who was a former mayor of one of a, of a city who participated in the violent uh, uh, protest, but he didn't go to Panama to become the ambassador of another country. You know, so he went through his process. He was sanctioned at the time. I think he did jail time because of what he did. And then he came out and, and became a candidate. And he streamed right. But he's there and in the ballot. Mm -hmm. So, you understand, this isn't, this isn't a, there's no exclusion, even of people like that. He's running. But there, there were limitations by law on Maria Corina and, the, and the, she could run. <coughs> Again, their strategy is insurrectional. Their strategy is not electric. Mm -hmm. Can I answer one question? Sure. Uh, I come from Canada. Can you speak louder, please? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Speak up. Uh, when I decided to go to Venezuela, I informed my party. And the center committee asked me, they said... And the, the, the party is, sir? Center committee, oh. Communist Party of the... Uh, okay. I am a member of the Communist Party, the Canadian Communist Party, sir. They asked me, this election is fraud. Yours of the Venezuelan Communist Party is mm. not supporting. So you go and analyze which is the right things. What is the reason they are not suffering? So this is a complex issue, um, and and you may be you may be it would be interesting if you talk to some people from the Communist Party here, mm -hmm. because there is there is internal tension within the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. There is a group within the Communist Party that. Um, started distancing themselves from the revolution. Not now, but already a while ago. They even had problems with Chavez. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's from, a long, from a long time. And this group eventually started getting stronger and, and concentrating the, you know, the directorate of, of the party. And some other party members started reacting against this. And since they had the control of the of the com of the central committee, there was there was exclusion. So you, if you talk to different communists here, you will find some of them that will say that they were excluded, purposely excluded from the last Congress because they didn't want to break with the government and they didn't want to take a position against Maduro. There's a reading that they do of uh, you know the the internal situation in Venezuela which is very questionable because it's almost simplistic. You know, the reason you say, oh, you know, we have a problem with salaries, you know, we should have higher salaries, but we have a blockade. We're in the middle of a war. And precisely what, what they're doing is blocking state income. So if you have no state income, you can't raise state salaries. That, that's what's basic. So, so the way they, they approach it is as if, the government doesn't want to, but the, just the numbers you know, don't lie. The sanctions are also designed in a way where the, pub, the private sector can sort of thrive while the public sector is being hurt, mm -hmm. except when the private sector allies itself with the government. If the private sector tries to come and do some arrangement with the government, then they'll also target some people specifically. <clears throat> but in general terms, it was, it's part of that narrative, see, the government can't do anything, but the private sector can, because, you know, socialism doesn't work, but this is part of that dynamic. So to approach it in the sense of, you know, the government's not doing enough for salaries, is a bit either naive or consciously playing, you know, uh, I, for the enemies. Uh. Now, <clears throat> whatever you may do, of course, it's... It, it, it's possible to have criticisms, to you know, to have to, to believe that you take things in different directions or you know, do different policies. But to come out and 
and have an approach where you're going to support imperialism's proposal against Venezuela is very questionable from a communist perspective. And you have communists here who will tell you that the first duty of a communist is to be an imperialist. And to allow yourself to be part of the game of attacking the revolution. And to and, and, and you know they, they tried to promote a recall referendum against President Maduro. The base of the Communist Party didn't didn't support it. They defended the political rights of again Maria Corina Machado, which is also very strange for a communist party to defend the political bourgeois rights of the most, you know, the, the, the most elitist representative in Venezuelan politics. So there's a lot of things at play there. There's a lot of sectarianism. There's a lot of foreign money also. And then some, some of the communists that were upset with this went to the Supreme Court and asked and, and said, look, the, the way the 16th Congress was, was conducted was was you know was 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 legal? We weren't able to participate. We we need you know to have this done again. Supreme Court, you know, uh, favored them, and there, and then established a new temporary board until the, a new Congress can take place. So there are new authorities of the Communist Party, which again I, I insist that it's good to listen to their perspective, and which are questioning that old board. And right now, after that new uh, structure came into play, I mean, the, the new leadership, the Communist Party has actually grown. You see, they, re, they, they reestablished um, committees in all states. They have a new youth of the Communist Party that is active. And you see them now supporting President Maduro in the rallies. Uh, uh, and it makes sense that the Communist Party is actually, you know, supporting a revolutionary process mm -hmm. and not siding with, an, you know, the imperialists. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mato, feels like a student. Sure, please. What the new board is, what do you mean by that? Just let me ask you something. Did it just say something prior that you could read Steve Elmer's? He published an article, a very interesting article, because he, you know, you can read the Tribuna Popular, that is the newspaper of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And basically, he was reading, he read all the Tribuna Popular that you can read it on the, news, <coughs> on the internet. Mm -hmm. And he said to me one day, William, all the Tribuna Popular, the only thing that they do is to criticize Maduro, mm -hmm. to talk about corruption, to talk about you know, all kinds of stuff, but they never, rarely, they talk about sanctions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the main reason that the country yeah. is in the situation that we have right now, that we are facing right now, is because of sanctions. So they rarely mention the sanctions mm -hmm. in their newspaper. So and that's something very interesting. And, 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 and there was a lot of people who were talking to me about it. So you should get an article is on the money review. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. I, I'm a religious person I'm here. I'm just uh, wondering what's the Cardinal Porras is doing? I mean, what's his uh, involvement right now? I know what happened with Chavez, but now as we move forward, what's going on with the Catholic? I, I, I believe he's retired. Yeah. Uh, not no, no. 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 No, oh, because there was a new bishop that has, has just been appointed to replace him. No, 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 he is. He, is. Huh? he was giving mass yesterday. No, I know, but but he's not he's the bishop. The he's not so the archbishop. No. no, no, there was a new archbishop. There's new, there's a new, there's a new archbishop. Okay, but but it's a big force and uh, yeah, of course. So I just want to hear a little bit sure. of the Catholic Church. And, on the, the, the relationship with the Catholic Church has been difficult in, in, in Venezuela for, for several reasons. First of all, because it was, um, the, uh, as opposed to maybe the Catholic Church in other parts of Latin America, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador, with, with Nicaragua, they were, they were a lot, they were very progressive. In Venezuela, they were more, they were, they've always been more of the conservative side. Now, 
when the revolution first uh, started, there was a, one of the conflicts that that you know that that that, that came to be was because there was a lot of um, uh, subsidies, government subsidies to to the schools, and. And so, so when we were talking about expanding public education and improving public education, you have to go back on the subsidies. So that was one of the first tensions, and of course that derived into other political things because you know the, what a, uh, the approach of Talis to to Cuba. Then you know they they they, they built on this issue of you know left wing communism being anti religious, etc. <coughs> um, Overall, I think um, the Catholic Church has played many times a role of uh, being, at, you know, partially, uh, you know, openly anti-government, and and I think it hasn't worked that well for them at the level of of the masses because I think a lot they actually lost, I think, a lot of support. As a matter of fact, today the the advance of some evangelical religions in Venezuela, which is another issue in its own, um, but that is partly due because of the alienation that the Catholic Church did uh, of, the, of, of, of the base, of popular bases. So um, this week there was an article where they call, uh, it's, it's, it's one of these uh, Catholic news services. And they say something like, Maduro is Catholic, but he comes from Jew a Jewish background, or is for the you know Sephardic Jews that migrated, and you know, but he believes in some uh, Hinduism. So there's a lot of questioning on 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 his stand. And then they say, uh, but then Maria Corina Machado is, you know, more of a Christian, but. She's also open to gay marriage and some, yeah. but El Mundo is uh, a nice, you know, uh, more, yeah, <laughs> yeah, very, very uh, traditional type of guy. So, to me, that's just again interference, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I think um, people in Venezuela don't normally vote because of their religious preferences. I think it's safe to say that okay. we've been able to transcend that a bit. That's good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sure. Uh, sure. You, I, did, did you have to? I did. Uh, Sorry, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he uh, had uh, a yeah. yeah, I was asking what the new board was when this shit took place. What the new board? Ah, no. <coughs> no. Uh, I mean, there was a uh, there was an appointment of, of members of the Communist, of, of other members of the Communist Party. To the board of uh, to the central committee, I guess it's, 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 it's so there were members yeah, of the that's party. What happened with the Supreme Court again? No, the, they asked the Supreme Court to intervene, mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court named a temporary board so they would carry out a new Congress, mm -hmm. and, that, and that is still in process. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so it, it, it happened in the middle. Internal. It happened in the middle of the elections, and obviously, okay. elect everybody's mobilized for elections after the elections. I guess they will do their. Mm -hmm. Uh, so go here. Yeah. Uh, um, I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, one is dealing with sanctions. Okay, uh, we've been talking about that and how to get around it. Uh, I think BRICS and China represent two two ways to get around that. So I was wondering if you could talk about that and whether or not uh, uh, Venezuela That's will uh, become a member of BRICS in October. Um, and then the second question is a little out of that. It's dealing with Palestine and whether or not uh, Venezuela will actually join <coughs> South Africa's case against the ICJ. Uh, I mean, in yeah. Yeah. South Africa's yeah. case yeah. in the ICJ. So, um, the sanctions. The uh, sanctions. Yeah. <coughs> China and BRICS. So, so, okay, so, so BRICS, we've asked for, for entry into BRICS. We're hoping there might, I mean, they have to determine how they're going to do the expansion. 
Well, I mean, one of the things I've heard is that they, they're still discussing how the process is going to take place. I mean, they just let some few countries in. I think there's there's a discussion within them whether they should open to more countries now or maybe wait and, you know, have, like, associated countries, not direct members. <coughs> they're working on that. And they have to make a decision. I mean, the original members have to make a decision. Um, but we have asked, and as far as we know, we have the you know, support of uh, all of them. I mean, the, or at least all of the originals. And then we have to see what the new group says. Um, besides that, um, I, I, I mean, yes, I think BRICS is a, is a path. Uh, it's one of the paths, at least. But, you know, it, that's still on, on the construction. You have, a lot of things have to happen so you could actually have alternates to mm -hmm. the SWIFT uh, yes. Uh, program so that means so you could actually do the deposits and all these things. I mean, the, these are complex. I mean, not they, even between Russia and China, they're now just doing things mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if the they, huge, powerful eco economies, you know, still haven't figured exactly everything out, you know, we'll still in a way. Well, but we. Oh, uh, excuse me, but uh, the petrodollar being gone now, well, that, that's certainly. Well, we, what, what we're trying to do is. Uh, with, with the anti-sanctions uh, uh, law, uh, we we open the path where we can actually have more flexibility to you know to find ways to deal with with uh, the sanctions, um, and meaning you know to to be able to do swift uh, you know. Uh, arrangements so that we can deliver or somewhere so we can actually build a fund to uh, cater to uh, public works and other uh, and, and, and social programs so we create a structure um, a lot of the things are not we can really discuss because for example if we manage to find a way to take one ship to another place Correct. Then they find out, and that's going to be blocked. Now we have to find another one, and that's been the story for the last, you know, four or five years. How to, you know, uh, deal with that. Um, so a lot of these things are done in certain in, in certain way where, you know, we we cover ourselves so that we can. Uh, um, so it has to be done in in, in that way. Um, but we've been able to have achievements. Um, that show that we've been able to overcome some of the sanctions, or at least mm -hmm. know how to get around them. Um, for example, the fact that today, I mean, we went from five years ago being a country that imports more over 80% of, of the food to being able to produce mm -hmm. more than 90% of, of you know, the basic staples here. That's that's a big deal, mm -hmm. and we and we achieved that because of the you know the the necessity of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Being able to of having to produce, yes. mm -hmm. and a lot of that, I mean, also fortunately has been done in a way where you know the chemicals and you know the the mm -hmm. uh, agrotoxics are Better. you know we can't import them either, so we can mm -hmm. be able to uh, find other ways to produce food, for example, mm -hmm. um, and those are part of the you know the the, the achievements or, or the you know the the things that we've been able to do circumventing the sanctions. <clears throat> now, there's licenses, and during this administration, we have received some of them, but the licenses are a tricky thing because they give the impression that it's some sort of lifting of sanctions, and it's not really that. It's administrating how the flows of oil and of, and of funds go. So it's not... And, and also, it's, I mean, we can't say the sanctions are something positive because it's legal to have sanctions in the first place. So, if, I mean, so licenses are positive. Mm -hmm. Licenses are not positive because they maintain the sanctions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only, the only legal thing to do is lift sanctions. So, you know, it's like saying, well, I put you illegally in jail, but I'll give you a pillow so at night you can, <laughs> you know, you can rest, you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe it's better than sleeping on the floor, or, you know, whatever. But it's not legal. It's not right. So it's it's more 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 or less the same thing. Um, and we were able to, uh, I think, to to move around that. We've been able to work on developing other sources of uh, income for Venezuela. 
that it's no longer so dependent on oil and but trying to look at other things tourism uh, pharmaceuticals uh, different <laughs> well we're trying I mean it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because there's a lot of um, the structures are not there. I yeah, mean, I don't want to push you, but let me take this opportunity to ask you about the seven points in transportation. Oh. Do you know where they are? The seven what? The, the seven transformations? transformations? It's okay, don't worry. I, I, I used to know. <laughs> 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 she is, she is yeah, she, yeah. Yeah, she, yeah. All right, so I'll, okay, I'll, get, I'll go back to... I'll let you ask. Me. I no, but, sorry, but you, you have yes. you have one more point uh, about no. sanctions and the past. Okay. Sorry. So so with the past and we broke relations in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, 2008, 2009. Uh, can you forget on people? 2008, 2008, or 2009. Um, and we've been supporting. Uh, and of course, we we had a strong position in the past. We have this issue with the uh, Yemen over. Uh, yeah. Border issue, mm -hmm. and it's something, and we we don't recognize the court's uh, jurisdiction. So we we, expl we 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 publicly have stated our support for South Africa's uh, initiative. Coming into the actual trial has to be cleared by our lawyers because it because of the effects it's going to have on the other uh, trials that we're. So that so that that specific issue spend, is pending. Although we have expressed publicly and, and we have accompanied uh, South Africa's uh, petition against uh, Israel, and we're very. I mean, the first. My understanding is the first uh, um, aid that actually got to Rafa uh, came from Venezuela. Which, which we also had to do in silence because of, <laughs> so that the plane wouldn't be confiscated. Thank you very much because um, I <clears throat> knew that Venezuela fully supported that stuff. Yes. And no I, doubt. I knew the history, yeah, the mm -hmm. history behind it, but I, I couldn't understand why they hadn't no, formally joined, but I understand. We have a legal now. issue that yeah, our lawyers yeah, are working yeah. on. So to see how far we can actually go, and that doesn't affect this other right. previous claim that we have. Yeah. Sorry, now, now let me, okay. please. Yeah, uh, there's oh. a little follow-up here. Okay. Just follow up to that. Uh, can you explain uh, those legal issues having to do with Guyana and any involvement of the American U.S. oil company? I think it's Exxon. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll give you the short answer. Okay. The short answer. We could be here for two hours. Okay. <laughs> this is an issue that stands. For almost 200 years, and it's a border issue. And it's not an issue with Guyana, it's, it's, it's originally really an issue with the British okay. Empire. Mm -hmm. And there's a dispute of, on, of over 160,000 kilometers, territory mm -hmm. of that, that's, that expansion, mm -hmm. which were originally Venezuelans, and they started in the 1800s, started you know, mm -hmm. moving in and moving in and, and claiming it. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, there was an agreement signed by, it was actually a, a decision, a, a document uh, uh, made in 1898 that that gave the territory to Guyana. Okay. But there was no Venezuelans participating in that resolution. There was, I mean, there, it, it's actually one of the first very good examples of the Monroe Doctrine, mm -hmm. because Venezuela actually, for for about 50 years, begged the United States to get in, because we felt, you know, the British Empire was, you know, mm -hmm. attacking us. And when the United States actually got in, took Venezuela out and rearranged everything with the British and pretty oh, much, yeah. you know, kept what it felt it would keep for itself, which, mm -hmm. you know, and then gave the British the rest. Okay. We've questioned that afterwards, mm -hmm. and in 1966, and I'm rushing through this whole story because otherwise, you know, but in 1966 we came with another agreement mm -hmm. where it says that there was a problem with the original decision of 1888 mm -hmm. that it had to be reviewed. Mm -hmm. And we had to come to a solution on terms that were acceptable to both countries. In mm -hmm. this case, now not the British, but Guyana as an independent country. Mm -hmm. Since 1966 until now, mm -hmm. this issue was resolved diplomatically. Mm -hmm. Meaning, in the document, in the agreement, it said, well, you have to go to uh, good offices, you have to go somebody to mediate, that you have to have commissions, that you have to go to the UN. So there's a whole, a whole bunch of 
steps. Mm -hmm. And we didn't solve the issue, but we were Working. continually, you know, discussing these issues in a diplomatic manner. Mm -hmm. 2015, Exxon Mobil finds oil okay. in the waters. Now, of course, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but we're talking about land issue. Mm -hmm. But you can't demarcate waters on, until you've solved the land issue. Oh, okay. So what Exxon does, and Exxon, Exxon has been, had been expelled from Venezuela in 2007 by Chavez because they didn't agree to a renegotiation of, of the uh, oil contracts. Mm -hmm. So they were kicked out. And of course, they were very resentful for that. Mm -hmm. So in 2015, they find oil on that side, and mm -hmm. they say, OK, now we're going to pressure Guyana to take the, you know, un a unilateral course oh, okay. to take this, take this to court mm -hmm. so that then Guyana can give us the, the rights to, to, the, oil to oil. The, the concessions. Okay. So Exxon starts pushing for that. Mm -hmm. While actually, it starts, so for, first is Exxon, 2015. And then it's the US State Department that also helps the, the Guyanese government and, and pressures the United Nations mm -hmm. to, to have this ta be taken to a unilateral route through the court. Mm -hmm. I say unilateral because we haven't agreed. See, the, 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 the agreement of 1960 says, says it has to be something that's mutually agreed between mm -hmm. the two countries. Mm -hmm. We're not agreeing to the court mm -hmm. because the court is going to decide without, you know, mm -hmm. going to give it give one or the other. It's not going to be a fair distribution. Mm -hmm. um, but they're taking that route. And then when you realize that in 2015, Exxon funds it, mm -hmm. and the president of Exxon is Rex Tillerson. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, the US State Department helps it, and the, and the Secretary of State is Rex okay. Tillerson. Mm -hmm. ah. So then we know where we're going. OK, so this has become an issue of Venezuela against oil, yeah. against Exxon Mobil. Mm -hmm. It's not against the people of Guyana, which we've had good relationships. We've never, nobody's ever, in all those years, nobody's ever talked about war, about, you know, confrontation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, th there's differences, and of course people get, you know, nationalistic a bit, and you know, but nothing, <coughs> you know, nothing Science. more than that. Mm -hmm. But now, the, they're using this issue to, mm -hmm. to also uh, send troops, uh, establish bases mm -hmm. in the region near the border, mm -hmm. illegally, because yeah. they're not supposed to do that without you know, our consent. Mm -hmm. they're gra they, and, they, and they've granted uh, concessions of those waters that are still not determined. Who, for the years to come, mm -hmm. there's going to be a strong military presence there, mm -hmm. you know, the threatening from the U.S., mm -hmm. threatening Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And we see, if you look at every country the U.S. has a problem with, mm -hmm. there's always a border, you know, dispute with some, I mean, there's always some tension. Mm -hmm. Ukraine, Taiwan, you know, you want to mm -hmm. pick, pick a place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I understand. And there are bases there right now. Uh, okay. 14 <laughs> Sonic Command bases, 12 CIA bases. 14? Bases. That we know about. South Korea? Okay. South Korea. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Changing the subject just a little bit. Thank you so much for, yeah. for this. Uh, now, the Venezuelans are going to the polls, and so are Venezuelans abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like you to comment on what the situation about access for, to, to the vote is yeah. among uh, those Venezuelans that are residing abroad, be it in Colombia or the United States. And the reason I ask is because the part of the media war, apparently Martha Al and I Al were, were watching Al Jazeera this, this morning, morning. I don't know why, but we were. <laughs> and we heard a, you know, the narrative now is uh, poor Venezuelan immigrants in Colombia who, uh, who were oppressed by the dictator Maduro here and are now hoping that they can cast their vote for the opposition, take him out of power, and be able to come back to a better country. And they're not going to be able to. And, and, they're not, and they can't cast their vote because the maybe they don't. Allow because them. the embassy doesn't allow it, because there aren't. The, what was it? They don't have the right documents, they don't yeah. have their passport or their residence in the country, whatever it is. Well, so, 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 the, so there's laws, like everybody else. And, and that they're not new, that they've been established since we, I mean, we only started voting outside of Venezuela in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Because that's actually, I, I, used to live in, I used to live in the US, that's actually my first election I voted in the US. 
um, and and the and the uh, you need to have to vote. You need to have your ID card like here, mm -hmm. uh, and you need to have your and you need to prove uh, residency mm -hmm. because otherwise, I mean, if the idea uh, there's no tourism for Lex. I mean, you can be um, you know taking a trip somewhere and then I'm gonna go somewhere else. You know, in Venezuela, we don't have also male voting like you have in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We have, you, you live in a place, you register in that place. I mean, you don't have to live, I guess, but you, you register in that place. That's your permanent residence legally. And, and you vote there. And I say that because some people, for example, here, uh, my family is from Trujillo, so I go vote where my home, my, my parents' home is, that kind of thing. But otherwise, you live, you know, you vote where you reside. Mm -hmm. um, so, so outside is the same logic. You can vote outside if you're permanently resided in that place, and you have to have some proof of that. Migration with Colombia tends to be very agile because people go, work, come back. There's actually people at the border that you know go to school that are on one side and you know work on the other side, you know that, that kind of thing. So there's a, so there's an issue about a lot of people being residents. And or, or not being residents because they don't they don't need it because they go back and forth, mm -hmm. and you can easily go back and forth. Now you can't vote there, or or you have or if you or if you if you have settled there, but you haven't done the right paperwork and you have I mean you, you you've been living there for a couple of years but you're not necessarily completely settled. You also you can't vote because you have to prove that you have some sort of permanent residency in that country. Mm -hmm. In the case of the U.S., there's no relations, there's no embassy, there's no consulate. Yeah. Oh. So where do, how can we vote, mm -hmm. or how can people in in in, in the U.S. vote? So like Willie has to come vote here. Right. <laughs> he can't. He can He can't vote in 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 the U. You know. I always come uh -huh. to vote. <laughs> so he has all, yeah. So 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 it's 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 a it's a trick because you know you you and, and, and b b b by the way. We opened the voter registry for this election, and only 60, you know, they, they say that there's 8 million Venezuelans outside, that they've left, whatever. That's also very exaggerated and manipulated. But you know how many people actually signed up to vote in this last update of the registry? No more than 70,000 people. 70,000, not millions. So... It's an issue that... So it's a thing about people actually also... Yeah. I, I just want to add that I just received, I think they sent me the information of the Venezuelan people from the position protesting in the former Venezuelan yeah. council mm -hmm. building, you know, diplomatic building, mm -hmm. saying that they will be protesting because the dictator chief did not allow them to vote. Right. <laughs> Religions are broken. Yeah. Canada... Canada, last time, last election, didn't allow us to carry out the election. They forbid it. It's actually, I always, I always bring this up because it, it's, it's the one case I know where a country actually forbade us to carry out an election inside our embassy. Mm. And didn't allow Venezuelan people to vote. Mm. Because they didn't believe that the election was, was uh, legal, so they decided that we couldn't vote. I mean, there's a lot of, it's a lot of manipulation. If I may, just another brief uh, uh, follow-up on migrants. Um, I uh, work in San Francisco, and a lot of the legal aid organizations there are mentioning that uh, the people that walk through the door looking for legal assistance are Venezuelans looking to go back to their country. The reason why they're seeking uh, legal uh, assistance is because they don't want to perhaps lose their you know, pathway to citizenship in the U.S. They want to keep that door open, so, or maybe they need help with the tickets. So what's, what's the situation now with the numbers of Venezuelans coming back, and what does that, that tell you? If you look at the numbers now, you, you, pro you, probably have, uh, you, know, you probably have more Venezuelans coming back than you have leaving. Okay. Oh. I mean, the, it's probably about a three to two ratio. Um, because a lot of people have uh, decided that, you know, um, it wasn't what they thought it was, you know, they, they didn't want to come back. There was a lot of 
xenophobia. There was a lot of attacks on, on you know, on people um, in other countries. So a lot of people want to come back. And President Maduro has created a program where we're actually receiving and helping some of the people that can't afford to come back to come back. We actually started the pro. I mean, the the right now it, it's taking a. a, a, a stronger phase or adaptation where now we're helping some people come back and we're also helping people decide to stay or immigration is right you decide to stay and we try to help those people as well with legal advice and whatever um, but at the point where in the pandemic especially and and you know where there was a, where it was very difficult for people to to come back we set out conviasa our national state airline to pick up some people and, and bring them back and then conviasa was sanctioned so this notion that uh, U.S. politicians play with, that, you know, oh, we're sending all the migrants and whatever, and we don't want to hear. Well, when we try to bring people back, they sanction the airline. And we, and we can't, we, we can't, we were never allowed to take one of our airplanes there to pick up people and have them come back. They're not allowing that. You know, if they really wanted to deal with the issue, you know, with... Voluntary migration or, or returns. You, you know, we can, we can, uh, we, we, we could have taken care of that, but they, they don't allow us to do it. Um, and also, one thing I would add that in, when you hear that now, the you know the proposal of the candidates and everything, this the, the opposition here wants to say that oh, if they win, then people are going to come back, or you know they're going to be the ones. But they're the ones that made people leave in the first place because. They're the ones that promoted the violence, they're the ones that promoted the sanctions, they're the ones that promoted the reasons that people left. Mm -hmm. Why would we believe that they're the ones who want to help people come back? You know, we are the only ones that are actually trying to get some people to come back and to, you know, because we, we think that this, there's room for everyone here. Mm -hmm. oh. <clears throat> In terms of circumventing sanctions, what would you say? How much is factored in um, some people say concessions or alliances or incentives with private industries in that? You get in some of the, and I don't want to scrutinize internal uh, politics, but uh, you hear in some media, progressive media, oh, they're, they're turning neoliberal. And uh, so how, is that, how much has that been a factor and how successful? We, we, have to, we have to, you know, I think, it's important that we, when we discuss these things, to 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 actually be able to define or to in, in, to people, you know, what we think a neoliberal government is, and what you know, taking some actions against a, an economic war, you know, against a sanctions war, are as well. Um, you know, we have two choices. I mean, in in a way, we we could say either we try to work with some of the people that are not sanction that so that we can get some things to come into the country and not have a crisis mm -hmm. or we can become extremely extremely purists and say we're only we're never going to work with anyone in the private sector and then probably have a collapse of the country in you know two weeks or two months um and we became so we our our commitment was to solving people's problems <coughs> Now, if we've had to, we've had to partner with some private, some people in the private sector. So we, for example, so we were able to import um, the the lutens and the, like other components so that we could produce gasoline here. Mm. We either did that, or we would have no gasoline. Mm. If you look at the case of our brothers and sisters in Cuba, for example, where they, you know, how how difficult it's become for them, because. <coughs> We now have an option that they don't have. They're completely blocked, and we have we have a small window. Our option was to take the small window and figure it out. But also to say that doing that, doing that, you know, partnering or, or you know, working with what we have um, is to turn neoliberal. It's also unfair and and you know it's not my character no 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 i know I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm not i'm not saying it to you i know i know you understand this but, but, but you know but, but i'm saying in general terms it's 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 malicious because <clears throat> a neoliberal government would have easily given in mm -hmm. yeah. what do you want you want me to privatize for the go ahead what do you want you want me to you know privatize school healthcare, whatever go ahead 
-hmm. It would have been much easier. For everybody, it would have been much easier mm -hmm. because sanctions would have been lifted on the on the president and you know everybody else. I mean, the president is the person who has a reward on his head for fifty million dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have. It's easy for you know he would have easily just turned and said you know I give in. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. You know we maintained the project. They blocked the food. We provided you know subsidized food for people to resist. Mm -hmm. You know they they they've attacked us in different ways, and you know we've established means of sustaining people. At work, and you know, even though they attack the salary, we're you know we try to find ways to help people live, mm -hmm. guarantee rights, because the 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 other uh, option is Millet. Mm -hmm. I mean, what has happened in Argentina in the last six months? Mm -hmm. Sky. I mean, we lowered inflation, mm -hmm. allowing people to have better you know purchasing power. You know, mm -hmm. calm things down. They hyped up, I mean, the, now they're in hyperinflation, which we're not. Mm -hmm. They're in hyperinflation. They kicked about 15,000 people, or even more, because I mean, I know one case, of one, one uh, labor union that was complaining about 15,000 people that got kicked out of the job. There's a lot of people being kicked out of work. Mm -hmm. That's a neoliberal government. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that. We're protect, we protect people's employment. We protect people's mm -hmm. food. We protect people's... So we're doing that while we partner, while we deal with a war. Mm -hmm. And this is, especially for our comrades, you know, this is what we have to understand. In the middle of a war, you don't choose. I mean, you can ask uh, Mao, <laughs> any, any, any uh, communist leader in history, and they say, you don't choose the conditions where, you know, mm -hmm. that you have. Yeah. You, 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 you fight with what conditions you yeah. were given. Mm -hmm. And under those conditions, the priority of this government, and this, and this is why I personally stand with President Lou, is because his, his uh, priority has always been to help people survive this, to help people get through this, mm -hmm. and not turn back into a neoliberal puppet that we used to be before 1998. Mm -hmm. Prioritize the most vulnerable. Yes, of course, of course. Can I ask any question about this? The comrade has a question, then I'll go to you. Um, so, um, the statistics you quoted about uh, the progress towards food and so on is, is impressive. Do you think that means that the Venezuelans won't go hungry again? Do you think about those terms? We, well, I mean, I think we have better chances of, of, of uh, look, when we were, Prior to the revolution, uh, malnutrition here was somewhere around 18%. Of, you know, and by 2011, when Chavez was still there, that, that went down up to like 3%. When the sanctions started kicking in, it went up again. So about 13%, still below of what it used to be before. And now we're trying to bring that back down. We have better chances now, but we we still have adverse conditions. You know, I'm I'm telling you things that have been positive that we were able to accomplish, but we have 930 sanctions on our heads. And again, there's a there's a very tough issue with state salaries. I think that's you know that's one of the things that that hurt us the most. But it's because income is being blocked. We have to we have to fight that. We have to overcome that. So to, for, me, for me to say, well, now everybody can eat everything and now everybody, that's, you know, that's not also not realistic because, you know, we, we have poverty because those conditions got aggravated because of the sanctions. We were fighting poverty. We were conquering poverty. We diminished tremendously the, you know, the, the number of people, poor people in Venezuela before the revolution. But obviously that, that had to go up again with the sanctions. We're in a war. So... We have to uh, struggle so that people, you know, not every, not everybody can, you know, is there. Are we in a better position than we were four or five years ago? Yes, we are. Much, much better than, than we were four or five years ago. But have we solved everything? Or are we, no. We're in the middle of the war still. Um, what, what do you think about the 
what's the legal basis for barring candidates providing you said that there's one candidate who participated in the lottery but is almost convicted but he's running Ray Machado can't run in her because her. because every 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 individual case you know I mean there he went to jail I mean there was there was there were certain uh, there were certain things that that took place she has sanctions on or uh, yeah sanctions I guess uh, it's a sort, a sort of sanction uh, 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 because of uh, her um, there's administrative actions or there's administrative measures against her there's uh, because of uh, irregularities uh, during her tenure and and there's more serious charges uh, because under the Venezuelan constitution you cannot accept uh, appointment from another government so and, and that's a com completely whole different issue from from Ceballos. I mean, there was an issue there that he, you know, went to jail for, and you know, and there was measures taken in against him. And this is a different. This is a different issue. It's, he has received an appointment from a foreign government, which is against the constitution. Um, and of course, her, all her ties to, you know, calling for sanctions, calling uh, for for the calling for the non-recognition of the of the Venezuelan government and, and, and allowing them to take CITGO in the accounts and everything. Is her, is her bar in permanent or...? No, it's, uh, I think it's 15 years, something like that. Something like that. Not, I, I, you, you might want to, because when you take the, you, you might want to uh, check, double check, I don't, I don't know exactly the years, but there's a... Uh, 15. Uh, 15. Uh, 15, yeah. okay. Good. Good. Yeah, I think Give me, give, me, give me one second because you have a... Yeah. Yes. Actually, I asked you about this question before uh -huh. in a Zoom meeting. Uh -huh. But you answered me with it in a one, sentence, one sentence. But I want to get more information. Uh -huh. But it's about the... We need for any government, it is Cuba or Venezuela or Nicaragua, need foreign investment mm -hmm. to things to raise the standard of living. Mm -hmm. But my question is, what is the China's... Uh, oh. role mm -hmm. in Venezuela okay. and the Russia you can provide some information, protect? We, we, I mean, we've had a strong relationship with both, uh, and China has had a, I mean, the, they finance a lot of projects in Venezuela and trade for oil. Uh, we've had a, many years now, uh, we've mm -hmm. had a strong relationship with, with both, mm -hmm. China and Russia. Uh, I, I, I don't know enough because it's not my area to you know to give you uh, statistics, but we have a strong we, we have a strong partnership. We have a whole, I mean this this year uh, this year the past President Maduro went to China. We established a level of relationship. It's called an all weather, uh, which is a, which is one of the highest levels of partnering that that China has with other countries. So that means we're going to have, I mean, we have uh, educational exchanges, we have investment, we have a whole set of different things. I mean, from Venezuela's space program that they're helping us build, uh, you know, to education, uh, agriculture, a lot of exchanges in agriculture, uh, industry development. Um, it's, it, it's that type of uh, partnership and, and similar, similar with Russia as well. I don't, it, those, those two countries are now under my my supervision, so I don't, I don't have the details that I could off the top of my head. Any special project they are doing here? I could tell you, I could tell you, I mean, the, I, the one I remember, for example, is, uh, I mean, we have the exchanges with the uh, space program, for space example. Program. Mm -hmm. we've, we've launched two satellites, two Venezuelan satellites, mm -hmm. with Chinese phones. And there's people training for space station and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. I think that we're going to be exploding. Carlos, and yeah. Yeah. I think that we have been abusing him. <laughs> but I want to just to, because we have to think that, that I, I think that should be the last thing right. to talk to him is about the conference that is at Alba okay. that will start tomorrow. People want to know what's going on in those days, and what kind of program is coming, where that I think that's very close to the building. And also, we have the issue with the visa. So we have some issues with some visa. So, so can you talk to us a little bit about this 
conference that starts tomorrow. Ah, okay. And, and who's coming? Everybody's asking. So, so, so in the middle. So, so in last um, April, um, together with Alba, we did this. Uh, we as Simon Bolivar Institute, we partnered up um, on this project to draft a document. That, was, that is called the World Social Alternative. What we're trying to build is a, a sort of set of guidelines where we think that people on the left can have like a minimum common agenda. Because we think that we're facing a lot of you know, risks from the extreme right throughout the world. And we need to have a project that we can collectively defend. <laughs> Of course, it has to be broad enough so that you know we can agree to certain principles, mm -hmm. like you know, free education, public education. These these broad terms, we can't get that specific because obviously when we get too specific, you then you go into each country's particularities, and then you know, it becomes a, a very complex mess. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that we have at least something that we can agree upon and 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 sort of fight together and and and, and join together. Because the, the right is can easily always I mean they're all in interest and making profit and that's how they unite. Mm -hmm. We are more about principles and ideas and how we're going to do this and then we fight more <laughs> amongst ourselves. It's more difficult for us to come to a summit. But we have to find a minimum coming ground. Mm -hmm. So we, we we drafted a document. It's been reviewed, you know, and 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 tomorrow or in the next two days, what we're going to have is a lot of our friends that are coming that are also coming for the election have been involved somehow in this process, or have seen the process, or are interested in the process. And we're going to discuss a couple of things that came up after the last event we did in April that we found interesting, ideas, themes that we can discuss and that we can, you know, uh, uh, maybe deepen the discussion and then, you know, reshape the document and move forward. It's an ongoing process. We're going to do this, you know, for, for a while. But we wanted to have this discussion and take the opportunity to have it now. So it's going to be tomorrow and, and the day after tomorrow right next door, which is the uh, Bolivar Theater, and you're welcome mm -hmm. to come and participate. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Um, so, there's different people, I mean, we have from uh, International People's Assembly and Tricontinental Vijay Prashad, then we have, uh, we have Atilio Boron from Argentina, Irene Leon, I mean, a lot of people linked to the um, to a network of intellectuals uh, in defense of humanity, uh, social movements, parties. There's a lot of people. You'll see there's there's a lot of people that are coming to the elections from different parties throughout the world. Um, so it's, it's there's a very broad uh, group of people that are going to participate. Just to let you know, tomorrow we have a meeting with Alex Shah Great. in the morning. Very good. But after that, we will we'll yeah, come then. back. Yeah. And we're and gonna you know, start around. We're gonna start around 9:30 ish. And also, the job of asking that we have some uh, people that are leaving after the visa is expired. Okay. So, I will be sending information. Send me the list so we can. The list, and I have it here, but I will be sending it through, okay. through WhatsApp. And, and yeah, I think I'm. When, when are you, when, when is most people, when are most people leaving? Or? So, it's a different day. Some people are staying for a little longer. Like 15 more days, 10 more days. But the difference between the visa and the uh, the day that they are leaving and the expiring of the visa is like three days, okay. two days, something okay, like that. Okay, just, just don't let it expire. Yeah. I mean, let, let me know before you, before it expires so that we can... Maybe, okay. because we will, they will say, yeah, I will send you that now. Okay. You let me know. Um, so I think that we should have Carlos. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you take a picture of the group, please? Yeah. yeah. Sure.